Sabo School and welcome to Jacaranda SDA Church's Sabo School lesson for today. We would like to begin by a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we would love to thank you once again for this beautiful morning you have given us. We want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for you are the Redeemer of this world. You are the Protector, Heavenly Father, and you are the one who guides. Heavenly Father, we would like to dedicate our Sabbath program into your holy hands. We ask and pray that the Holy Spirit may be with us, Heavenly Father, that we may teach and convict. We also want to, Heavenly Father, put your church into your holy hands through these trying times. We pray that you may continue to sustain. We also want to pray for each and every one of the members, Heavenly Father. We pray for our leaders as well. We also, Heavenly Father, want to pray for all those, Heavenly Father, who are out there, Heavenly Father, wondering. We pray that they may be called back into your fold, that as one Heavenly Father, we may call, we may go, Heavenly Father, and tabernacle with you once you come the second time to take us. Be with us now and forevermore. We ask and pray. Amen. I would like to welcome you once again to our morning worship, and um, I hope that you've had a good week. It's been a very interesting two or three months as people have been panicking, not knowing what to do. But we should always remember that we have a God in heaven, and he's the one who created this heaven and the earth below. We pray that as we at home, we're going to enjoy our Sabbath worship, a time that he set aside as a memorial to remember his goodness, his kindness, his love, his creation, that we may tag tabernacle with him and enjoy the service. In beginning, we're going to have a special song. I hope this special song might remind us of his, his loving mercies, that we may be with each and every one of our single members, we remind each other of his goodness, his love, that through his music, we remember each and every one of our problems. But we should also remember that through these problems, there's a redeemer who saves, there's a redeemer who heals, there's a redeemer who is always going to be with us. Shall we enjoy our service? Enjoy this music. Four years have traveled along the road. My life was empty of joy, every joy. I pray.
I hope you enjoyed this song. Um, sometimes we must remember that music has a way of touching each and every one of us in a way that even words, sometimes even words of encouragement might not. Um, at this point in time, I would like to take us into our mission story. Good morning, my brothers and sisters, and I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, I have a special message for you, and uh, it basically touches on the topic of reconciliation. And uh, the title of my message is Reconciled and Recreated. We shall consider a piece of scripture at this moment. Uh, which is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17, and the Bible reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The scripture says, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation. Now we'll consider three main points or three main views that we can pick from that uh, piece of scripture. The first is that we need to be in Christ and not just bear his name as Christians or just move around in circles. Our Christianity needs to be serious because Christ paid a high price for our souls. The second is that outside Christ, there is doom, death, and confusion. Number three is that Christ is our shield and cover from trials and temptation. So it is very, very important that we need to be molded in Christ. And when we become molded in, in Christ, we become a new creation. In short, we are recreated. God has reconciled himself to us through Jesus Christ. And um, as God was reconciling himself to us, he basically did not impute our sins upon us. Christ was made sin for us that we may be righteous. And it is for this reason, my brothers and sisters, I implore you, on Christ's behalf, to be reconciled to God and to be restored to God in relationship. And let us not just be reconciled to God, let us also reconcile amongst ourselves. We need to return to the original state of things as it was before sin entered into the world. Reconciliation is a product of love. And we show that we love one another when we reconcile. So my brothers and sisters, I urge all of you to be reconciled one to another. And that reconciliation will then bring healing to our relationships. I thank you very much. Indeed, we must remember that God is willing to help even when we think that no one else can help us. He can speak to us in ways that others cannot. He can reach to our souls. As his word says, Come, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So, right now we're going to move into our health talk, which is going to be given to us by Sister Natasha Masite. I pray that you may be blessed. Please remember, these health talks are for us. Let us keep in mind that whatever we do, health must be the primary concern of our lives. For in it, there is nothing else we can do if we are not health. Please be blessed and enjoy this health. Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Natasha Masite and I will be giving you today's health talk. Um, we will be discussing the effects of mental health on music. So to begin with, we are going to define mental health. Mental health is a term that refers to 
the emotional, cognitive, and behavioral concepts of human behavior. Uh, it's sometimes used to refer to the absence of mental disorders. Next, we're going to define music. So music is an art. Uh, there have been many definitions that have been uh, made for this word, but different scholars have all agreed to the fact that it has to do with emotions. So one um, definition that I like, it says, music is an expression of emotions through harmonic frequencies. So music will involve people singing or playing instruments or both at the same time. Uh, a, a quote that I love says, God has woven music into the very fabric of creation. That, it, just, it always makes me smile whenever I hear it. I don't even know who said it. <laughs> um, in Job chapter 38 verse seven, uh, when God was talking about creation, he, he said, the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy. And in Revelation, whenever heaven is portrayed, they talk about it being uh, a place of ceaseless praise with songs of adoration to God and the Lamb. I think that makes music this very beautiful thing. So because God created us in his image, uh, we, we share an, a love and appreciation for music with all his creation. Yes, all his creation. So um, studies have been shown, have been done to show that plants have shown positive and negative growth stimulation to different kinds of music. And then in a nunnery somewhere in the world, they found that whenever they played classical music for their cows, they got twice the amount of milk than they, got, than they would have gotten if they didn't play the classical music. Um, so this shows that every piece of God's creation loves music, okay? So music can touch us and move us uh, with a power that goes beyond words or most other forms of communication can ever state. So how does music affect us mentally? Uh, first of all, music has got different characteristics that includes rhythm, melody, and harmony. These different characteristics, um, they affect our brains by modulating our heart rates and modulating our brain's neural networks. Uh, this is going to lead to various benefits, which I have a list of. It's not exhaustive, but there are about 10 of them. So first of all, you have improved cognition. That is memory, um, attention, reaction to, uh, to things, processing speed and whatnot. And then you have stress reduction. So stress reduction, um, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, Saul was dealing with, with a demon, with a, dis, with a distressing spirit from God. And whenever Daniel would come and play music for him with the harp, that distressing spirit would leave him. So that's a very good example of that. Pain management as well is another effect of listening to music. Um, Studies have been done to prove that in cases of a condition called fibromyalgia, listening to music has led to a reduced pain sensation. As well as um, in cases of surgeries, different kinds of surgeries. So it was found that listening to music before the surgery, during the surgery, and after the surgery led to uh, a quicker healing process than those who didn't do that. Uh, music also helps us sleep better. I'm a personal testimony of this. There's this particular classical song that whenever I fail to sleep, uh, it's called Claire de Lune by some French artist. And whenever I play it, I'm able to sleep much better than if I didn't play it. Um, an improved mood and symptoms of depression is also another uh, benefit of listening to music. Expression of thoughts. Music has got ways of helping us find words when we can't find the words. Maybe someone sang a song and they have, this, they have these particular words and yet you don't know what to say about something and you listen to that song and you feel like it's saying exactly what you're thinking. I, f I feel like everyone has had a moment like this. Um, social connections. The thing about listening to music and saying, oh, these are the words that I was thinking, that usually will make you feel like you're not alone in the world and that's something that can be related to social connections. Um, boosting creativity is another thing that has been found to be helped by listening to music, as well as improved motivation, which in cases of physical performance, like exercising and whatnot, will lead to increased endurance, as well as um, an improvement of the performance. And lastly, but not the least, and one of the most surprising for me, was weight loss. So it was found that in situations where people would eat in low-lit rooms with soft music playing, these people would eat 18% less than people in an opposite situation. 
And obviously, you know that when you eat less, you're going to, you know, weigh less. <laughs> um, however, music is not morally or spiritually neutral. Okay, so some music may, may move us to the most exalted of human experiences, while other music may degrade us and debase us. It, it can lead us to having negative emotions like um, despair, lust, hatred, and anger. Sister White says, um, music, when not abused, is a blessing, but when it is put to wrong use, it is a terrible curse. She also says, rightly employed, music is a precious gift of God, designed to uplift the thoughts to high and noble themes, to inspire and elevate the soul. Now, emotional regulation is an essential part of mental health. Um, poor emotional regulation is associated with psychiatric mood disorders like depression, and uh, certain music is going to evoke these feelings in us, as alluded to by Sister White. Okay, so this music can agitate us and unsettle us, and it's going to lead us to having things like increased stress, and promoting unhelpful emotions like rumination. So rumination is a situation where you are focusing on negative thoughts, okay? Continuously thinking about negative thoughts. So in conclusion, our musical selections must not cause us harm. As much as different people will like different music, because music is subjective, you can't like everything, we must bear in mind that our musical selections must not, must not cause us to have bad mental states. They should promote good mental states. Uh, we should ask ourselves as we are listening to anything, why am I listening to this music? Um, at, the end, at the end of it all, am I going to feel better about my situation? Um, and also, we should focus on Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, which reads, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. God bless you. That was our health talk from Sister Natasha Masita. We pray that, um, you know, we, through God's graces and providences, we may listen to what he's given unto us through our sister. That as we are going through this life, we make sure that we do our we can, that he may bless us with good health. Um, from Sabah School Department, we'd love to thank you for being with us this far. We're now going to go into our study. I pray that we may be blessed and enjoy what we had been studying all week long. Let us continue to study his word. Through this study guide, it gives us an opportunity to study as a family, not just our local families, but even at the world at large, preparing ourselves for his soon coming, let us continue to read and study his word. That is the way in which God speaks to us. And we pray to him to lay our problems. That's the way in which we speak to him. I hope you are going to enjoy this study and continue to be blessed by his word. Please enjoy. Good morning. Uh, viewers, uh, welcome uh, to yet again another um, Sabbath school uh, study lesson. I am your host, the man with many names, Jawota Joey Hamonga Hamonda Musa Mugando Gariba. And with me in studio, um, I'm joined uh, on my uh, left uh, by um, Elder Ronald Barrington Gambwa. Uh, and uh, on my right uh, is um, Sister Family Living. Uh, even as we begin our lesson, uh, I will just ask uh, Sister Livinga to uh, pray for us. Shall we pray? Our God and our Father who art in heaven, Lord, we come before you this time seeking your presence as we discuss your word. We pray that God the Holy Spirit will guide us through this lesson discussion. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. 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 Um, this week we continue to uh, look at uh, the main theme of the quarter, which is the uniqueness of the Bible uh, itself. And in particular we are uh, trying to focus on 
prophecy. And so we are looking at lesson number 11, which is the Bible and prophecy. And we, we do know as Seventh-day Adventists that our church is anchored on prophecy. Uh, and uh, a prophecy actually uh, is crucial to our identity and mission. It provides us with internal and external uh, mechanisms to confirm the accuracy uh, of uh, God's word. And uh, that is what we want to look at this week. Uh, some of the things that, of course, uh, we will be trying to look at is how do we actually interpret this prophecy? Because, of course, we do understand that, that there are books uh, of prophecy within the Bible, and there are certain things which have been written uh, therein. But how do we get to interpret uh, these um, pieces of scripture? How do we get to understand and see what they actually mean, even in our uh, day? So that is the lesson that we uh, are looking at today. Uh, but let's start by looking at our key text, which is Daniel chapter 8, uh, verse 14, uh, which says, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Your reflection. Um, <clears throat> thank you, moderator. Daniel 8.14 is actually a prophecy in itself. Mm. And it's a prophecy that uh, uh, aligns itself to some of the events that were happening in the Old Testament, in the older times how the sanctuary services were being conducted. So this in itself is a prophecy that is given by Daniel that reflects on what was happening in the olden times. So we're looking at the Bible and prophets today. A prophet like this that is given, why is prophecy given to us? I think the answer comes from what Jesus says about prophecy. All right? In, uh, when you look at John 14, 29, he says, And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So the prophecy is actually given to us so that we will be able to know what is coming. So the things that we have heard or read, and then when they begin to come to pass, we can say, Aha, this is what it is. Exactly. So it actually goes to confirm scripture all right it affirms our faith and strengthens us in our belief the, the, the bible is uh, is is such that um, it lays things with a conviction all right it wants to prove things all right Amos 3 7 says before anything happens the lord gives a, a knowledge to the prophets so that they may say it and when it comes to happen, you can prove to say, this is true. So, prophecy is given for our confirmation of the scriptures. And also to know the times. To say, this is what was being talked about. Prophecy cannot be verified until it gets to happen. Okay, so I, I actually see an element here um, of, um, you know, uh, prophecy uh, having a link with history uh, and in last week's lesson we were looking at uh, the Bible and history uh, and uh, I do see a link here when you say um, I have told you these things so that when they happen so there must be some history before something else happens so historicism and prophecy what can we say about this um. History and prophecy. When we look at uh, Daniel and Revelation, John, as they were writing, they used uh, the history to put into perspective the future that was to come. And so, uh, historicism is a method that we use to study as Adventists the Bible prophecies. And so, the many prophecies in the Bible actually uh, flow just like history flows. 
when, when you are looking at uh, the study of prophecy, you need to look at it as we study history in school. Things follow and they flow through. This after this, then this happens after this, then the next thing happens. So there's an, an unbroken linear flow of history from past to present and to future. So we look at um, the connection in, with prophecy, history and prophecy in that it gives us what will happen in the future with what happened, with reference to what happened in the past. And so if we look at Daniel, he was uh, looking at what would happen in the future. In the dream that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, the image that uh, he saw, the kingdoms were flowing one after another. And uh, when he came to interpret what was happening in that image, it followed through just as history had laid it. After this kingdom, then another kingdom came to, to be. And then another kingdom comes in, another kingdom comes in. So we see that even he, the way we interpret history is the same way that we will take to interpret uh, prophecy. Because a good example is given in Daniel. Chapter 2, verse 27 to 45. We find this image and Daniel in, in, verse, in verse 36 actually, going to 45, he begins to interpret the vision uh, or the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he begins with the head, which is that golden, uh, the, the head of gold, which represented Babylon. And he moved on to the next part which represented uh, Medo-Persia. And he moved on to the next part. So there is, um, the metals were actually connected in that image. The gold, the brass, the silver, the iron, and the iron and clay. They were looking like they were not connected, but they were connected in that from the head, it's connected to the neck and the next thing comes through. And that is how the kingdoms were going one after another, even in history. So the historicism gives us a good basis to, for interpreting uh, prophecy in the Bible. The successions come one after another. There is no gap. They are all connected, just like time and history are connected. Okay, and I see one uh, interesting aspect. I mean, um, if uh, John chapter 14, verse 29, tells us that uh, I have told you these things so that when they begin to uh, happen, uh, you will have a knowledge of them and obviously they are going to uh, affect the way you will uh, be able to you know, go about a particular situation. Now, looking at our current day application, I mean, we have seen uh, the prophecies of Daniel chapter 2, the, Dan the prophecies of Daniel chapter 7, uh, 8. How do these actually help us um, uh, knowing to say uh, we have <coughs> these prophets, do they give us an ad, say an advantage or very much so? They do give us an advantage because uh, come to picture of it when Daniel was giving the <coughs> excuse me this prophecy in Daniel seven about the statue. Okay, uh, it was at the time of King Nebuchadnezzar was represented by the head of God. And he was talking of things that would come. Now, there are two aspects on which the Adventists have based their study or understanding of the prophecy. There's one history that lays the uh, events as they were unfold. Then there is prophecy. Prophecy which predicts of the history that will come to be before it does happen. So, if you are standing at this point, you are better off from the person who stood with Nebuchadnezzar when God gave the interpretation to Daniel to say these are the kingdoms that will come. Why? Because you will find that when you go down history, these kingdoms that Daniel predicted they would come, have come. And the history, the history books proves that these kingdoms did come. 
After Daniel, they came the Middle Persians. And they followed. And the history gives all the prophecy gives that actually it will go up to the end when this statue will be blown with a stone that is used without an arm which we have an understanding of so at this time where we stand we have a good understanding looking at the history what was predicted which came to be over the ages we have a better understanding now so this goes to confirm that like Christ said I'll say it so that when it comes to happen, you prove to say it is the truth. Okay, now, um, when these, these things are happening, I think when you look at, um, a, for giving, say, the prophecies of uh, Daniel, there seems to be time which is linked uh, with them. And I think one of the key principles that we use uh, as a church to interpret uh, these prophecies is the year day principle exactly okay uh, now with this year day principle uh, how exactly uh, is this principle or what is this year day principle and how do we um, interpret a prophecy using this year day principle just like we were saying God gets to reveal the prophecy. You will discover that when uh, Daniel goes to speak with Nebuchadnezzar, he confirms, he says, this prophecy, this dream that you had, it cannot be interpreted by the wise men, nor the astrologers, nor any uh, definition, nor any science that you can think of, except God will do what will reveal. So we, we, we find that our day-year principle is actually also laid down to us by God. We start from when the Israelites are actually liberated from uh, uh, Egypt. Mm. As they are going, first they are sent, messengers are sent to go investigate that the land that they have to occupy. And that journey took how many days? 40 days to go to Canaan to go investigate. And when they came back, they gave a report after 40 days. And when they err, they uh, uh, rebel against God. They are taught, because you have rebelled against me. In the same manner that you took 40 days, this time it will be computed to you that you will actually now spend 40 years each day standing for a day. Each year rather standing for, or rather each day representing a year. So, instead of the 40 days, you will be actually for 40 years in the wilderness because you have done what? You have rebelled against me. So, we see the concept of a day, a year principle being actually first uh, instituted by God when you look through Numbers 14 34. God gives that idea. He's the one who comes with that, this denotion. And thereafter, in scripture, it is upheld. All right? Uh, you will find the scripture confirming that to God a year is like a what? It's like a day. So we get to uphold that principle. It is also from God that we, we, draw, we get it from. Okay. Actually, the, the year day principle is specified in, in Numbers 14.34. The Bible is clear on that even in the Ezekiel 4 verse 6. So, besides for us to actually understand it very well, if we follow uh, the kingdoms and the, the times uh, that we are reading of in prophets, like the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, if we apply the literal day uh, principle, these prophecies may not really make sense to us because they will give us such a, 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 a short span. It will not uh, relate to the time that these prophecies are actually depicting. So besides uh, uh, to support the, the year day principle, there are other uh, elements that the Bible uses to help us understand this. 
they are symbols, the long time periods, and certain peculiar expressions that are used. The evening and uh, mornings, when some of these expressions are used, then it shows us that what is being talked about is not literal, it's actually symbolic. So the, the symbolic nature is also seen when we look at um, Daniel, because we are looking at the prophecies of Daniel. When you look at Daniel 2, the image there shows um, the progression of the kingdoms. And then when you, in Daniel 7, Daniel 8, we find that there is now presentation, not of the image, but of beasts that are simply depicting or representing kingdoms in the same way as the image is uh, depicting. But when you, 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 you study through everything, they still connect into the same thing. There's a, a kingdom that the kingdoms that will come will finally come to an end. They will all be crushed and the eternal kingdom shall come to be set, the kingdom of Christ. So whether the symbols are being used or the, the, the time is also being used, we as Adventists apply this year day principle and it, it, it gives us specific times when we calculate to show us where we are and where we are going and ultimately uh, where we stand before Christ comes to set up his kingdom. Okay, and somehow I think also using uh, you know the same historicism, we are able to see how these events which were predicted are actually tying in with these same time periods uh, when we uh, use the year day principle, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Okay. Because you find that when you also check the history, it gets to confirm the Bible. When you go through history, you discover that Nebuchadnezzar, the image that uh, represents the kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar uh, ruled from 605 BC to 589. All right? That is confirmed by history. All right? And then the following uh, uh, bronze kingdom of the Middle Persians, you find that in history, it is actually said it was from uh, 331 BC to 168 BC. All right? And they fought up to the iron and the clay age, where we are today, which started in 476 AD. So you find that from history, we are able to link the prophecies as they happened. So we get the confirmation. And that's why, as Adventists, we rely on historicism as our mode of interpretation of the prophecies. Now, as we focus on uh, prophecy, maybe if we can just try to get deeper into Daniel chapter 7. Uh, okay, I think in the study you've mentioned Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8. Um, when we read Daniel chapter 7 verse 1 uh, to 25 and also Daniel chapter 8 verse 1 to 13, we actually do see something peculiar here which is uh, the aspect of the little one. Exactly. Uh, and there seems to be some commonalities. Maybe we can quickly just have some quick reaction. What are the seven common characteristics of uh, um, this little horn and how do we actually identify this little horn? We probably go back a bit behind. I think Sister Livinga did mention to say our prophecies are depicted by symbols. Alright? And when we look through, uh, Daniel 7 depicts a symbol of a statue. Alright? And when you come to 8, it is now the beasts. Alright? These beasts, some have horns, some have teeth, and you have never seen a beast that has actually iron teeth. So that shows it is not the actual beast which would have iron teeth, but it should be representing something. So this is how now the symbols that are depicted, we discover that there is some uniformity of these symbols. Alright? They represent kingdoms. The, the ones who represent kings. But then, when you come to Daniel 7, 1 to 25, and you look at Daniel 8, 1 to 13, this special one that comes is different. Alright? It is not only ruling on earth, 
It endeavors to speak great words against the Most High. So it wants to have an influence even where in heaven. So this is a peculiar symbol of the horn that is given. It's not the ordinary that we were given of the horns which represented the kings that ruled on earth. But this one is different. It has an influence here down on earth, but it also wants to speak blasphemous words in heaven. So, <clears throat> you get the inference that this thing has two aspects. It has the political as well as the spiritual. Alright? So it reaches out. And when you go back to history, you discover that, yes, there was a power that came, alright, that unseated. When you go in the statue of Daniel, you find that the ten toys would actually represent the ten hidden kingdoms. But these ten, from history, we know that three were uprooted. And who uprooted this? It is this small old power that came. It was different in its nature. It has the political part as well as the spiritual part. And when you go through history, you identify to say, actually the kingdom of Rome transformed itself from being a political kingdom to having a religious kingdom of some sort. We find the introduction of the, the poor as actually now the ruler who takes both the political power as well as the power over the church. So, this is how we get now from history and from the prophecy to identify to say, oh, then there is little horn that is actually being talked about here. is a peculiar one. But history has pointed to who came at that time. And even in history, it is said, the prophets did do indicate to say, after a period, he was injured as if he would die. And when you go into history, you find that during the French Revolution, one of the generals of Napoleon took captive the Pope. All right? And that now goes to confirm, well, what prophets is saying about him being like injured, is actually true because history confirms it and the bible has actually symbolized that it would happen in the prophecy it is given as a symbol so we can identify uh, the little horn as papa or Rome. exactly exactly and you know daniel 7 and daniel 8 have these commonalities in this in the little horns both talk of the little horns and so we find that uh, the, the little horns that is being talked about here has similar things. Uh, in Daniel 7, the, the little horn is pers has persecuting powers, like Elder has said. And uh, it's also exalting, uh, self-exaltation, and speaking blasphemous words against God. And actually targeting God's people, both horns in seven and eight, actually are similar because they are also in the prophetic time. The two, as he said, these horns are kingdoms that are both supernaturally destroyed. They they don't end naturally. They are both both uh, ending in a supernatural way. So these kingdoms as the uh, elder has clearly said, uh, connect in uh, history and prophecy. We come to prove that what the Bible is talking about in, um, in prophecy and what has happened in history actually uh, tallies. If we go further, as the elder was saying in Daniel, the representations of the image and uh, Daniel 2, we look at the, uh, the iron being... Uh, representing Rome and up to the feet, you know, the feet of iron mixed with clay. This is uh, at the end of the image where clay and uh, iron cannot mix. The kingdom that we see of iron, the old I think mentioned, it takes us to the kingdom of Rome, which started uh, as a pagan, and then it ends 
as a religious power and then it is speaking pompous words, blasphemous words. So these things when we follow, we see that this power is uh, clearly identified in prophecy as it was in history. But even as we look at uh, the same uh, image, uh, we, can, we see what happens uh, after that there is a stone which comes uh, at some point. Yes. Uh, and uh, also, apart from that, we also do see when we read in Daniel chapter 8 what happens uh, when we get to uh, the end. And we have been able to identify <coughs> all these and even link them uh, to time. You're using the year-day principle. Uh, and uh, using historicism. Mm -hmm. But then coming to the 2,300 days, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, lead us to 1844, uh, what is our comment on that uh, with regards to what is happening uh, in heaven? Since we have seen all the, these things, they are actually tying up. Uh, but 1844, starting from 1844, what is happening? Um, when we follow our history as Adventists, we see that the 2,300 days, this prophecy of time is, uh, is not literal, and so it is 2,300 years that we are talking about. And we see that uh, this prophecy is, is being referred to as evening and mornings or days. And so these years, when we follow through prophecy and 1844, in between, as we read, we find the 70 weeks prophecy. This week, this 70 is also not taken literally. It is uh, uh, 490 uh, days or years as we take the year day principle. The 490 uh, years are cut off from the 2300 uh, years that we have been given there. As we read Daniel 9 24, we find that the 490 years are cut off, and in fact, uh, Many scholars, uh, scholars correctly see the 2,300 day prophecy of Daniel 8 and 14 and the 7 week prophecy. So these two parts, when we calculate following our, our a year day principle, when we remove the 490 years, we find that it terminates into 1844. Now what was happening in the year 1844 is that the time Christ moved from the Holy of Holies in heaven into the most holy place. Now what is happening at this time is that as we read uh, the in heaven judgment is set. Christ now begins the investigative judgment. While we are here it is starting in heaven at the termination of the, the, the period and beginning of 1844. And so the date for the, the period that Christ is now doing the invest, is going into the most holy place is referred to, in other terms, the atonement. Okay, so um, if I may just um, um, cut you short there. So what we do have is um, we have uh, Daniel chapter 8, uh, verse 14, uh, referring to the 2,300 days uh, and the sanctuary being cleansed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, looking back in the day, uh, in the Old Testament, again, historicism coming in and our interpretation, we do see that there was the cleansing of the sanctuary. And exactly. what was happening uh, was the priest would go into the most uh, high place, mm -hmm. Uh, and he would atone there and then next what comes is judgment, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so uh, with that, um, uh, I wish to conclude uh, with saying we have seen all these, these things happening uh, from the first prophecy up to 
uh, the very last one uh, in terms of the kingdoms, the images that are coming. Uh, and the last thing that we see is this stone which is cast uh, and takes out all these things and then it est establishes an everlasting kingdom, uh, which is Christ's soon return. Uh, so with that, uh, I wish uh, to thank you all for this discussion, uh, even as we we'll end this lesson, just to uh, emphasize that prophecy indeed helps us uh, to be sure of uh, Christ's second coming and also to be sure that indeed there is judgment when all these things uh, come to pass. Uh, as we uh, conclude or as we end the program, Elder uh, Kambwa, just uh, give us a word of prayer. Shall we pray? We thank you, Heavenly Father, because you desire that we should know the times that we live in and be able, Heavenly Father, to await your soon coming. We realize, Heavenly Father, in as much as we are not able to predict the exact day that you are coming, signs that you left us with, the prophecies are indicating that we are in the last days. Therefore, as we live in the last days, we want to plead and pray that may we live according to your word, improve our relationship with you, draw us closer to you than ever before, Heavenly Father, for even the COVID is a testimony that things are no longer the same. You are but at the door and you are looking for those that will open their hearts and receive you. As we, Heaven Father, continue studying your word, we plead and pray for he, the Holy Spirit, to give us an understanding of the word. We ask that, Heaven Father, you may heal us spiritually as well as physically. For we plead and pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, viewers, for joining us. And stay tuned for uh, the programs that are coming uh, after this. And remember to join us again next week for another uh, Bible uh, study discussion. That was it from our study. Um, indeed, our study has been powerful. As we've been through this year, we've been through a lot. I pray that as we continue to study, we might be reminded of the times we live in. Indeed, he is coming soon. And we must always remember that we are, always, that we are pilgrims on this earth. For we have a home which is not of this earth, but is in heaven. Soon and soon enough, he will come for us. I pray that you've enjoyed our Sabbath school lesson for today. I pray that as we are going into our next segment, you might not leave, but we continue to tabernacle together. Please enjoy today's sermon, and I pray that you continue to be blessed. Happy Sabbath, and uh, we love you as Jacaranda SDA Church. Peace be blessed. Enjoy your service. for the village sheep. He thought being a shepherd boy was very boring. So yeah, he had an idea. He cried, woof, 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 woof. The wolf is attacking the sheep. Woof, woof. The villagers came running. They found there's no wolf. They said, don't cry wolf if there's no wolf. The next day, the, the little shepherd boy looked at look at the clouds float by. He took a nap. Time was going very slowly. He said, "I was more important yesterday." He, said, he cried. Woo! He he remembered his excitement yesterday. He cried. Woof 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 woof. The villagers came running. Then. They found there's no wolf. Then, in the, in the night, the little shepherd was counting the stars, and he saw two glowing red eyes coming to him. 
he is he was scared. He was scared. He cried woof 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 woof. The villagers put their pillows around and started to and started down for one second. Then next morning the the, the Toshiba boy went in town and said that the she the the wolf the, the sheep are all gone. The wolf came and chased them all away. Then the villagers said that we are going to help you find the sheep. Just remember not to lie. Oh or, or, or why the territory people think that you are lying. <laughs> I was speaking. I've missed everyone at church. I've missed my fellow pathfinders. I miss going on trips with you guys. I've been studying at home. I was supposed to write my exams this year, but I'm not sure if I'm going to write them because of the same coronavirus. But I've missed going to church. I've missed studying and I've missed going to school. And what I've been doing to be a good Christian boy at home, I've been helping our aunt at home and I've also been reading the Bible. Hello guys, my name is Timba and what I've been doing on quarantine is just nothing. Just feeling bored, not doing anything. You can't sleep because mommy will be, what's doing, what's doing this, what's cutting vegetable? Hey, this is, this is. So, it's just boring. Yes. And what I'm trying to, and, and what I'm doing to be a good Christian is just trying to not do bad things. <laughs> Good 
Good morning, viewers. I wish to welcome you to yet another uh, divine service. Um, as you might be aware, we are in the month of stewardship, and I do pray that uh, you will be blessed. Uh, as we start our program, uh, shall we just close our eyes as we invite the Lord in prayer? Our gracious, kind, and loving Father who dwells in heaven, we want to thank you for your love, mercy, and kindness. More so for this privilege that you've accorded unto us to come and sit at your feet. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with us and that, Heavenly Father, you will feed us with the word from above. Our God and our Father, we pray that you take control of this service, even as you empower your man servant, Pastor Sindolo, who is going to break the bread of life to us. That, Heavenly Father, when all is said and done, we will all become candidates of heaven and that, that our names are going to be written in the book of life. Our God and our Father, we now pray that you uh, be with the viewers and the listeners, that they too may be enriched, for we pray in Jesus' name with thanks in our hearts. Amen. Okay, so um, at this point in time, uh, we will um, sit quietly, even as we uh, listen to a special song. Waiting you to the family of God. Go we together, enjoying the trip, getting you. Thank you. 
thank you very much for that item of music. Uh, indeed, it is spiritually uplifting. Uh, at this point in time, uh, allow me to invite Pastor Sindolo uh, to come and give us the bread of life, which is uh, due in season. I take this moment to welcome everyone, wherever you are able to watch, I pray that the Lord will bless you even as we go through his word. Before we go through, together I request that we pray and seek the Lord in prayer together. Let us pray. Our dear creator, our amazing God, we want to say thank you for many blessings bestowed on us. As you speak to us, may you, Lord, help each one of us and meet us at our point of need. May we experience a revival and reformation. After this message, may we testify of your presence and help us by guiding us through this message. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to invite you that we read together from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, on verse 13. Jeremiah, chapter 3, on verse 13. Here is what the Bible says in the King James Version. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. This is a word that God himself is speaking to the children of Israel. And this is the time when we had the reign of um, Josiah during this period of time. The wickedness of Israel, the wickedness of the people who were known to be a peculiar people, at this time had displeased God because Israel had gone too far into wickedness. The title of our message Revival and Reformation. If there is a problem in Israel, what is it that needs to be done to solve the problem of wickedness, of all this um, uh, indulgence in sin that is taking place in the land of Judah? What should be done? Dear servants of God, as our title is revival and reformation. The thing that Israel needed at this time was a revival and also to, to do reformation. Before we go any further, allow me to look at the word revival and also reformation as we define these words. Reformation According to Noel, um, no, Noah Webster Dictionary of 1825, it tells us that reformation is a change from worse to better. It's a correction or an amendment of life. It is also telling us that this is a way of moving from a correct corrupt lifestyle to a better one. What about revival? Revival in the same dictionary is defined as a time of awakened interest in a religion, a renewal, a revitalization, rebirth, and a resurrection. Maybe these definitions may not reach to the mind of each 
of the people that are listening and watching at this moment. Let me bring them down to our level. The word revival may mean if I was living a life without prayer, I begin to adjust and begin to pray every day in my life. This definition can also apply to reformation. It may also mean if I was not living a life of Bible study, I begin to adjust and begin to read God's word in my life. Dear servant of God, it may be possible that I am an 11 hours worshiper, but when reformation and revival takes place, the definition will tell us that this is beginning to worship God from sunset Friday to sunset uh, Sabbath. This is what it may mean to, be, to experience a revival and a reformation. Mrs. Ellen White um, 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 also gives her definition in the book Review and Herald. And this is February 25, in 1902, where for both revival and reformation, she says, Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, an awakening of the powers of the mind and the heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. Here, Sister White is saying, revival is when a person died spiritually, interest of godly things, spiritual things was not there. But because of this revival, a person begins to see value in spiritual matters. And the person begins to change, meaning a reformation is also taking place. In the word, reformation, the same book, she says, Reformation, on the other hand, signifies reorganization. Maybe another word, to reform, a reformation. I used to play soccer. I remember one time I was playing uh, for our school team, Navoe High School at that time. We were playing Bama uh, Secondary School at Nationalist Stadium. Now, when the game started, our coach told us we were going in the game with a 4-3-3 formation. And we went into that game. It was in the first half that Bama scored in a way. And we were down by a goal to knee. As we were playing, it was a difficult game for Naboe. And we didn't know what to do next. Our formation, 433, was not helping us. When we went for half time, our coach spoke to us. He says, the way we are playing, we are not doing well. This is high time for us to begin to reorganize. We need to change a few things. And the, the coach told us, we are going in the second half with a 4-4-2 formation, meaning one striker was dropped into the midfield. Remember that the midfield controls the game. And when we had four people in the midfield, we were able to score in the second half three goals. And we beat Bama Secondary School by three goals to one. When you reorganize, when you experience a reformation as a child of God, there are many things which will not remain the same in your life. You begin to change. Let me take you back to the Bible. When we looked at the vision of the, uh, the Bible that we read in the book of Jeremiah, we saw what happened in the life of and ministry of King Josiah. He came in as a king at a time when there was serious wickedness in the land. Now, I want to invite you 
so that we look closely at what King Josiah did to bring about revival and reformation. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34, reading from verse 1 up to 13, for the sake of time, I will consider verses 1 up to 7. Come with me. I will be reading from the New International Vision Bible. Verse 1 tells us, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. Verse 2, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David not turning aside to the right nor to the left. Verse 3. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the, uh, the God of his father David. In his twelfth year, he began to page Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, and caved idols and um, uh, cast images. Verse 4. Under his direction, the altars of the bars were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them, and he smashed the Asherah poles and the idols and the images. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned, on verse 5, he burned the bones of the priests on, the, on their altars, and so he paged Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 6, in the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and in the ruins around them, he tore down the altars and the Asherah poles and crushed the idols to powder and cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout Israel. Then he went back to Jerusalem. Dear servants of God, if you went down, the same we have read in the seven verses is what you will discover in the remaining verses. When Josiah became king, it was not an easy time. Remember in Jeremiah chapter 3, we were told that God himself is describing the time of Josiah at the time when he comes in as a king, that there was serious wickedness in the, in the land and everything that was happening could easily be defined as evil during that period of time. The people of God were no longer worshipping the true God they concentrated in worshipping other gods, including Baal. They had forgotten their God. It may be true, dear servants of God, during our time, we may be so busy with the things of this life, such that we forget our own God. We forget the things that we need to do as children of God. As in the times of Josiah, it was so wicked. Let me just give you an example of a few kings that were there before King Josiah became king. Remember that before Josiah, there was his great-great-grandfather by the name of Ahaz. Ahaz was the king of Judah, and he reigned in Judah for 16 years. And we, we, when we read about this king, the best that we found about him is that he sacrificed his son to a god who was a heathen god. Nothing good or closer to what God expected of a king in Ahaz was done by this king. Dear servants of God, meaning Ahaz did not set a good example amongst all those that were before, before him. Dear servants of God, the next one that reigned after Ahaz was King Hezekiah. 
when we read about Hezekiah, he was a king in the land of Judah for 29 years. And this one, when we read about him, a summary will tell you that he was a God-fearing king. After King Hezekiah came in King Manasseh, King Manasseh reigned for 55 years. The major part of the reign of this king is defined by wickedness, is defined by evil. He was a king who also sacrificed his own sons. He's, he saved heathen gods. He worshipped and led the people far away from the true God. The later part of this king, when he was in captivity, we are told that this king repented and began to do right with God. But when we look at the major part, when he reigned, it was all evil and evil. And this is why when we talk about Manasseh, the bigger part of what will come in our minds is that he did wickedness before the eyes of God. After Manasseh, his own son, Ammon, became the king of Judah. Ammon only reigned for two years and he was assassinated. When we look at the two years of his reign, it was all evil. The altars his father Manasseh had started to destroy, him started to rebuild. The altars of Ba, he started to rebuild them and started encouraging people to worship the heathen gods or dear servants of God. When we look at the period before Josiah, and the example of the kings, you will see that we are very close to a period of 100 years. In all this period, only in the reign of King Hezekiah, there was something that Josiah could learn. But look at it. When Josiah becomes a king, he is only eight years old. At the time when he is coming in, in um, to be the king, to bring in revival, he started doing things as a king when he was still eight years old. Oh, dear servants of God, when it comes to revival, when it comes to changing our things that are not right with God, it doesn't matter our age. We don't need to be old. We don't need... Uh, to be young, whatever age we are, God is saying revival and reformation belongs to each one of us. Revival knows no age. Therefore, Josiah becomes king. And when he becomes king, he, begin, he began to reorganize the things, to change things in the land. And when he changed this, these things, we are told that the kingdom of Judah were, uh, was again worshipping the true God as they should have. At the same time, the people in the land began to worship the true God because during this period of time, Josiah rebuilt the temple. Josiah rebuilt the altars for sacrifices or um, uh, to sacrifice to the true God. When all this was happening, there was again jubilation in the land. When they saw that this young king did wonders, brought the people back, no wonder we can say that from the age of eight, he reigned in the land of Judah for 31 years. Dear servants of God, we have heard about the period of Josiah. What happened in the land of Judah? Do we need a revival in our time? During this period, when it is a stewardship month, I want to let you know, dear servants of God, that this is the time when we need a revival than ever before. We need a revival. Why could be the question? 
Number one, because of the dwindling commitment to godly things. Do you know, dear servants of God, that spirituality is slowly and slowly dwindling in us as members of the church. At the same time, we discover that because of how we take spiritual matters so light, trivializing these things, oh dear servants of God, even things that are ungodly are being brought amongst us and we want to pretend as if everything is okay. There must be a revival. We must begin to commit more to God than ever before. When we look at those olden days, you will discover that churches would be filled to capacity very early in the morning. And people would come with their packed lunch because they know we are not going back home. But the spirituality of today, people will come just up to mid, um, uh, up to the main service and they are back to their homes and back to their own businesses. Church is just one of those things we use to pass time nowadays. No wonder even when we come to church, we are already dozing, we are already sleeping right when we come to church. There is a problem there, the dwindling commitment to godly matters. We need to adjust it. We need to begin to change. We don't need to continue in that type of spirituality. Oh, dear servants of God. Is it possible that you can sit to watch the movie that you love and right when you see it before the television set to watch and then you begin to doze? Is it possible? No, it's not. Unless a movie that you don't like, you quickly begin to doze because you have no interest whatsoever. Dear child of God, if there was a time you and I showed commitment to spiritual things, this is the time we need a revival now. We need a reformation now, dear child of God. Maybe somebody may still have a question. Why do we need a revival? The second thing, it is because of the low levels of spirituality. A very small number of people today are reading the Bible. We know, dear child of God, that today we have just remained with the slogans that we are Christians, 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 and some who even use slogans, we are a peculiar people. Oh, dear child of God, we are not different in dress. We are not different in eating. We are not dressed uh, different in the way we talk. When we mingle with other people out there, where is the difference? Where is the peculiarity? Oh, dear child of God, is it possible in our dress that people will look at us and begin to tell us that we look different from the rest. This is the time when we will make those adjustments in our lives. Have you asked yourself a question? Why is it a problem to find time to read the Bible? To find time to sit down every day in your life to begin reading God's word. Why is there a problem? It is because, dear child of God, there are low levels of spirituality and we can handle it when we allow God to revive us, when we allow God to reform us. Dear child of God, maybe you still have that question. You are asking, why do we need a revival? The third reason why we need a revival is that there are low faithfulness levels. Today, you will agree with me that homes are breaking because of low faithfulness levels, because of unfaithfulness in our homes, in our marriages. Couples fighting every day. Oh, we had this, we have that, hiding things on phones. Why? 
low levels of faithfulness. Dear child of God, if there was a time when in our marriages we needed a revival, we needed a reformation, this is the time and there is no other time but this one. At our workplaces, we need faithful people to be in our working places. Oh, alas, today, we have many people who are telling lie after lie in their working places. And faithfulness, even where we work from, dear child of God, look at, look at things around your life. Do you want to continue with such a life? This is the time that we begin to adjust. We begin to experience revival. We allow God to reform us because this is not what is expected of a child of God. We have problems of low levels of faithfulness even at church. Do you know that even right at church, we have people that will stand, look as though holy, but knowing in themselves that there is a problem of faithfulness in them. And this lack of faithfulness, it could be in tithes, in offerings. It could be in the positions we were chosen to serve God. Maybe we are not doing what we should do. We are just holding titles, but not doing the work. Oh, dear child of God, if there was a time when we needed to be faithful, this is the time and there is no other time. Look at your life, child of God. For how long would you want to continue with the things that you know that these God is calling wicked and God is calling evil. Revelation chapter 3 on verse 2. A word is spoken and I quote, Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds and finished in the sight of, the, uh, in, in the sight of God. God is the one who at this moment, dear servants of God, is seeking us and is asking, wake up, wake up, change that life, modify things, allow him to wake and change things in your life. He is willing to change us today. He is willing to change me today. The only thing we need to do at this moment is to allow God to work these things out for us. God is calling on his church, you and me, to wake up. God is calling on his church that we be awakened and we awaken the interest of spiritual things. God is calling us to recover from the state of spiritual neglect. God is calling us to be renewed, to have a renewed relationship with him. Oh, dear child of God, Today is the day. You don't need to wait for another day. Like it was in the time of Josiah. A revival and a reformation took place. Today we are glad. When we read of men like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was because of kings like Josiah such that that background was laid for those young men, even as they are taken into captivity in Babylon, they have that foundation. A revival was experienced, and they grew up in an environment that was conducive for them. It is very possible for our time. You can be that person that, can, that, that God can use to have others experience revival, to have others experience reformation. At this moment, dear child of God, allow me to share with you a story. And this story was shared by Elder Tembo of Bamora in Chiranga. Now, this story, according to Elder Tembo, he says he was in Zimbabwe with a truck. He was in a park. As he was in a park, 
He was told that in this park, there are lions here. There are lions here. There are other wild animals, dangerous animals in this park. As you move with your truck, and even in the night, if you park anywhere, you need to ensure that you have a fire with you. Therefore, Elder Tembo went as he was driving through the park. He had a breakdown. And he was reminded of the words, when you are in the park, keep the fire burning. He went, collected a few um, um, uh, pieces of wood, put them together, lit a fire there. As the fire was burning, he knew he was safer. As the fire continued to go down, he knew he was getting worried because if he was, uh, if the fire goes, uh, goes, goes off, the lions would attack him. But he always ensured, whenever he saw it going down, he ensured that he put the wood together to keep the fire burning. Oh, dear child of God, remember that the devil is seeking whom he may devour. He is after each one of us. He is after those that may allow him to take advantage of their lives. But the secret is, when a revival and a reformation takes place, we need to keep the fire burning. Don't allow at any point the devil to come to attack you. Allow God all the time to take charge of your life, dear child of God. Keep the fire burning. Keep the fire burning in your marriages. Keep the fire burning of revival and reformation. At church, in spiritual matters, keep the fire burning. Allow God so that he may be the one in charge of your spiritual matters. In all these things in your life, keep the fire burning, child of God. And the Lord will lead you to higher heights to greater heights, and he will bless you abundantly. I want to pray with somebody at this moment. You are watching us. When you look at your life, you have seen you need a, river, a revival. You have seen you need a reformation, just like me. Oh, dear child of God, you know what area, you know what it is, that has affected your life seriously. But today you are saying, I want to experience this revival. I want this reformation so that things could be better in my life. God is able to do that with you. He is able to change your life today. I want to invite you, child of God, that at this moment you close your eyes as we pray together. Let us pray. Our dear creator, our mighty God, thank you so much for this day. You have spoken to us about revival. When we look at our lives, we have seen, Lord, that we have wandered far away from you. The glad news is that when we look at the cross, we find our way back home. Have mercy on us, Lord. Forgive us from what we have done wrong. Permit us, dear Heavenly Father, that as we experience a revival and a reformation, may our lives never be the same again. To those with problems in their marriages, Lord, Revive and reform. To those with problems at their workplaces, revive them and reform. We pray even those with challenges, with spiritual matters, Lord, we pray that you revive us and you reform us. We want to experience this revival. We want it in our lives so that, Lord, even as we await your soon coming, we will be relevant in our times, just as it was with Josiah. May you, Lord, continue to guide us, 
continue to bless us because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much, um, Pastor, for that message. And thank you very much, viewers, for joining us today. Uh, just uh, to quickly mention to say um, we are yet to begin with our physical meetings, uh, but the church is still going to be informed in due season or in due course once uh, we begin our physical meetings for next week and the next Sabbath. Please still join us on these same platforms. And between now and then, uh, may God be with you. Stay blessed.